the greatest orators America has ever seen. And we're also going to take a look at several other very famous people and political leaders of the 1930s. Father Charles Coughlin headed the largest right-wing organization of the 1930s with over a million members. He was the editor of Social Justice Magazine, which had a paid circulation of over 900,000. That's larger than the daily circulation of the New York Times, of the Atlanta Constitution, or the Washington Post. While his was only a weekly magazine, the overall circulation, even in this day and age, was only exceeded by such giants as USA Today and the Wall Street Journal. Father Coughlin was on the radio, CBS, from coast to coast, but he had a very humble beginning. In fact, he only had a handful of parishioners in his first church, and they did not even have enough money to meet the bills on their mortgage payments. He was able to get on radio in Detroit, and he had to raise $58 for his, for his first radio broadcast. From that point forward, at age 34, he became an overnight national celebrity. Father Coughlin was concerned with the Depression, which was, was continuing into the 30s and actually did not end until the outbreak of World War II. We had over 25% of the American workforce unemployed. At that time, we had no unemployment insurance. We had no Social Security. We had no such thing as a minimum wage. Father Coughlin fought for all of these things, and they eventually came into being and he had a lot to do with this. At the same, during the same period, we had Senator Huey Long, who was on the rise with his Share of the Wealth program. We had the Townsend Plan. Dr. Francis Townsend wanted a 2% national sales tax to finance a Social Security program. He was extremely popular and very, very influential. Later, we, after the assassination of Huey Long, Gerald L. K. Smith, who is a Long associate in Louisiana, took his place and continued the Share the Wealth movement, which later became known as the Committee of One Million. Now, we're going to start by studying the style of several of the speakers of this period. We're going to start with Huey Long on running for president in 1936. His organization had become national and gentlemen like such as Dr. Francis E. Townsend of the Townsend Plan and Father Coughlin were all planning on supporting Huey Long for president. Of course as we all know in 1935, he was assassinated. We will now study Huey Long's style of speaking, which was a folksy, uh, gentle, and I would say rather comical, down-to-earth speaking. Millions of Americans had become street people. It's nothing like what we have today. The middle working class people were in soup lines, bread lines, seeking handouts, begging for food, living in shacks. They were desperate times, and they were seeking a solution. Various American leaders rose up and presented 
programs to solve the depression. Father Coughlin had the most effective answers to the situation, and Roosevelt adopted his particular programs and ideas. Here we see people being handed food on the street by churches and other social groups. We'll study Huey Long's style in explaining his Share the Wealth program. Nobody stands and not afraid to stand for Senator Long. crying for wool clothes and for cotton clothes. What did they do? They had Mr. Hoover's plan to plow up every third, every fourth row of cotton, and we laughed him into scorn a year before, and Roosevelt laughed him into scorn because Hoover wanted to plow up every fourth row of cotton. Now, what did Roosevelt do with your fellow townsmen? After we told you people that Hoover was a numbskull for trying to plow up every fourth row of cotton, why, they put it in to plow up every third row of cotton, one-twelfth more than Hoover himself had ever before. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party were just like the old patent medicine drummer that used to come around our country. He had two bottles of medicine. He'd play a banjo and he'd, he'd sell two bottles of medicine. One of those bottles of medicine was called high papa Laurel. And another one of those bottles of medicine was called low papa Hiram. <laughs> Finally, somebody around there and said, there is there any difference in these medicines? Oh, he said, considerable. They're both good, but they're different. He said, that high papa Laurel is made from the bark off the tree that we take from the top down. And that low pop of Hiram's made from the bark that we take from the root up. <laughs> and the only difference that I have found between the Democratic leadership and the Republican leadership was that one of them was skinning from the ankle up and the other one from the ear down when I got to come. have less than a third the average. None to have more than 300 times the average. That means that no family will have less than from five to six thousand dollars of the homestead, the things that it goes to make a home, and no family will have less than from two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars annual income on top of that. That means that the billionaire and the multimillionaire can have a wealth not to exceed around five million dollars and an earning not Huey Long launched an attack upon the Roosevelt administration because of the dictatorial bureaus he was establishing which would control every phase of life throughout America. Roosevelt administration had the United States Senate that they were making a serious mistake when they began the NRA. They sat up and called General Hugh S. Johnson down here to take charge of that particular newly created government. And they began to prescribe a code for the man that was a Washington and a code for the man that was a president and a code for the man that was a milking and a code for the man that was making candlesticks until they finally got 900 codes and rule books many of which were as sick as a Webster's on a bridge dictionary. They provided for inspectors that you had to report to in the morning and for clerks that you had to report to at noon and for supervisors that you had to report to at nighttime. They made the whole business world, the whole laboring world, a crazy quilt, a mare's nest. And that confusion has destroyed and put many profitable enterprises further below the mark than they were to start with. And now they have a very poor idea of things if in order to attack me, they want to use that discredited name of General U.S. Johnson. To the Almighty to send us to a feast. We have knelt on our knees morning and night time. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. 
on earth as it is in heaven. We have asked the Almighty to fulfill that prayer of the Scripture, that he would smile on the fields, give us rain in due season, and cause our fields to yield the abundance necessary for life. And that prayer has been answered. There has been yielded too much to eat, too much to wear, everything to live in. The Lord has answered the prayer. He has called the barbecue. Come to my feast. He said to 125 million American people. But Morgan and Rockefeller and Miller and Baruch have walked up and took 85% of the vittles off the table. <laughs> Now, how are you going to feed the balance of the people? What's Morgan and Baruch and Rockefeller and Mellon going to do with all that grub? They can't eat it. They can't wear the clothes. They can't live in the house. Give them a yacht. Give them a palace. Send them to Reno and give them a new wife when they want it. That's what they want. But when they've got everything on the God's living earth that they can eat and they can wear and they can live in, and all that their children can live in and wear and eat and all their children's children can use, then we got to call Mr. Morgan and Mr. Mellon and Mr. Rockefeller back and say, come back here. Put that stuff back on this table here that you took away from here that you don't need. Leave something else for the American people to consume. Huey Long's Share the Wealth movement even had its own official song. Mr. Harry Link to come around to my apartment here in the New Yorker Hotel this morning. And Harry, what I want you to do is to see my composition, Every Man a King. All right. I want you to play it over these people. And if you like it, I want you to put it out. Every man a king, every man a king, for you can be a millionaire. But there's something belonging to others. There's enough for all people to share. When it's sunny June and December too, or in the winter time or spring, there'll be peace without end. Every neighbor a friend with every man a king. What do you think about that? Eh? I think it's fine. I think it's fine. Senator, I think it's fine. 1935, Huey Long was assassinated by a Jewish doctor named Carl Weiss. Thousands of people lined the streets to enter the rotunda of the Baton Rouge State Capitol to pay their last respects to Huey Long. The following day, the funeral oration was given by the Reverend Gerald L. K. Smith, and over 100,000 people attended, which was the largest funeral in American history up until this time. Gerald Smith continued the work of Huey Long and was later to join forces with Father Coughlin and Dr. Francis E. Townsend. Here we see Reverend Smith leading the funeral procession. With Huey Long dead, Gerald L. K. Smith, Father Coughlin, and Dr. Townsend had to find someone else to run for president against Roosevelt in the 1936 elections. Gerald L. K. Smith was a hell, fire, and brimstone type speaker as you will now see. Our Father Charles E. Coughlin represent the unmistakable edict that is being issued to the corrupt, thieving politicians of America that the baby heaven stump grubbing, sod busting, 
go to meeting. God-fearing American people are about to take over the United States government of America. Harold L. K. Smith at the left. Standing is Dr. Francis Townsend, and here is Congressman William Lenke, who would be the Union Party candidate for president. He's to cooperate with any program that looks toward the overthrow of the communistic dictatorship that has been set up in Washington, D.C. Over 45,000 Americans, representing every state in the Union, converged on Cleveland, Ohio. The convention hall was jammed. The speakers received a stupendous reception from the enthusiastic crowd. The first speaker was Gerald L. K. Smith. He was considered the most dynamic speaker of his type in America. Clap your hands till I tell you to. I'm running this proposition. I'll tell you when you got something worthwhile. Along comes Honorable William Lemke. He not only makes a speech, but he endorses the old age revolving pension plan and pays tribute to our leader, Dr. Francis E. Townsend. In the center, Frank Townsend on the right. Dr. Townsend speaks, followed by Father Coughlin, and then Gerald L. K. Smith. Phenomenal assemblies, whether they be headed by Dr. Francis E. Townsend, Gerald Smith, or Father Charles E. Coughlin, represent the unmistakable edict that is being issued to the corrupt, seething politicians of America that the baby heaven stump grubbing, sod busting, go to meeting, God fearing American people are about to take over the United States government of America. Father Coughlin's magazine looks something like Life magazine. And here you see a picture of Father Coughlin on the cover of one of the editions of his magazine. He built one of the largest churches in the state of Michigan. And here we see the tower in the front of the church. Every inch of this huge monument to Jesus Christ was designed by Father Coughlin with the aid of architects. There are two crosses on both sides, and then the image of Christ looking down upon the city of Royal Oak, Michigan. On the top floor of this tower was Father Coughlin's radio broadcasting studios. Over here, we see the roof of the church behind the tower, and we see the centerpiece above the church. Father Coughlin was the first in America to build a church in the round. Here we see Father Coughlin saying mass with the people seated in the round on all sides of the altar. Up here in the balcony, it's a balcony in the round. It was the first church of its type in America and people said that Coughlin was 40 years ahead of his time. In another case, Father Coughlin had President Franklin D. Roosevelt on the cover of Social Justice. Many people today wonder why. However, at one time they were very close friends and met often. Father Coughlin helped write some of Roosevelt's speeches because Roosevelt said that he would adopt a number of Coughlin's plans one of them called for doubling the price of gold. 
that would double the amount of money in circulation. Because in those days, money printed by the U.S. Mint was based on the amount of gold and the value of that gold in the treasury at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Roosevelt accepted that plan. Father Coughlin advocated Social Security, a minimum wage, unemployment insurance. Roosevelt promised all of these things to Father Coughlin. And because of that, in 1932, Father Coughlin hit the campaign trail and was the originator of the slogan, it's either Roosevelt or ruin. It is almost preposterous on my part to advocate your loyalty to Franklin D. Roosevelt. The events of the past three weeks are eloquent in themselves. Our laborers are being restored to remunerative operation. Our factories are open. The prices of our commodities have been raised. And why, may I ask you, simply because the money changers are being driven from the temple, simply because the outworn gold standard which held you and myself in bondage for generations has evaporated into the mists of the past. The great advantages obtained through the National Recovery Act are more or less insignificant compared to the greater advantages which the future holds for us once the fulfillment of Franklin Roosevelt's monetary policy will become history. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the day, despite all opposition to the contrary, that you remain steadfast behind the one man who can save this civilization of ours. It is either Roosevelt or ruin. I find it. To speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured will revive and will prosper. We must act, we must act quickly. And finally, in our progress towards a resumption of work, we require two safeguards against a return of the evils of the old order. There must be a strict supervision of all banking and credits and investments. There must be an end to speculation with other people's money. <laughs> and there must be provision for an adequate but sound currency. Father Coughlin's support continually grew. He had over 40 million listeners to his radio broadcast which could be heard in every state in the Union. Father Coughlin's mail amounted to over 40,000 letters per week. He had to employ a total of 124 office people. And here we show a picture of the ladies working in his office, opening the mail. He also had a private school, besides saying Mass every Sunday, and his radio broadcast, his weekly magazine, and he traveled throughout the nation speaking. Father Colvin was a great dog lover. He always owned a dog, and he preferred Great Danes. Pal was his favorite dog. And here's a picture of Father Colvin with Pal. The dog would actually stand beside Father Coughlin at the entrance of the church. And when the parishioners were leaving, they could shake hands not only with Father Coughlin, but also with Pal. Father Coughlin 
support for Franklin D. Roosevelt soon ended for several reasons. The re depression and recession continued on into the late 30s. After World War I, all veterans were promised a bonus, a $2 billion bonus to put more money in circulation. Roosevelt opposed this. The United States Supreme Court struck down as unconstitutional a number of President Roosevelt's programs. Therefore, he wanted to stack the Supreme Court with extra justices who would rule in his favor. He also wanted us involved in the League of Nations World Court. Father Coggan fought these moves, and he was able to bring 200,000 telegrams raining in on Congress, which defeated Roosevelt's move to get us into a world court. Coughlin then formed the National Union for Social Justice Organization, and later the Union Party, to defeat Roosevelt in the 1936 elections. We're now going to look at some of Father Coughlin's speeches before these conventions, before these great rallies, and I want our younger viewers to especially pay close contact to Father Coughlin's hand gestures, his mode of speaking, the raising and the lowering of his voice, because he was considered to be the most effective and powerful orator of our time. And you can learn much just by studying his manner of speaking. And now we give you Father Coughlin, the radio priest, and the greatest voice America has ever heard. That he retain his customary standard of living while he forces the laboring men of America by his cruel exploitation onto a wage level and a standard level that is just this side of the Bolshevik. ...of Christianity which abhors communism. In the name of patriotism, which loved America to carry it on to the... I ask you if you will rise in your places and pledge with me to restore America to the Americans. <laughs> The Warburg, the Morgan, and the Kept men. Oh, the nation is wise. This is what I so often refer to as the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. This is the system of modern capitalism, which from governmental analysis proves beyond dispute or question that in it there is no just sharing of profits in this nation. Remember that you're an American first. Remember that you're only Democrats, or Republicans, or Progressives, or Partisans, second. One Catholic priest for the first time in American history is seriously involved in national politics. Some are unpopular, but... God hates the hypocrites! At his shrine of the Little Flower near Detroit converge elements of a mighty political power. A power that grows with every name added to the 12 million already in his letter files. With every handshake that adds another individual to his colossal following, which he has welded into the most potent political lobby this country has ever known. The single voice... National Union for Social Justice. Culling, Detroit, from whose tower, the home of radio station WJR, have emanated many of the broadcasts of the Reverend Charles E. Coughlin, the voice of thought and sympathy from the heart of Michigan's greatest city. As the clocks in Detroit chime for... And those throughout the rest of the country chime their corresponding hours. Some 30 million listeners gather at their radios to hear the voice of the Reverend Charles E. Coughlin, the fighting priest, as he greets them with his cheery... Good afternoon, my friends. 
During the course of this address, it will be my privilege to disclose information which seldom leveled down through ordinary channels to the general public. It is my duty as your spokesman to present it to you in this emergency to the end that it will guide you in your decisions and stimulate you in your actions. I know that everyone in this audience is of one mind on this point, that we want more democracy in financial matters and less plutocracy in matters of exploitation. For at the bottom of this depression, it's a money question. At the bottom of poverty, of unemployment, of confiscation, it's a money question. In 1776, Washington and Jefferson and their compatriots had hurled at them lies and charges and the epithet of revolutionary. Their lands were overtaxed, their laborers and farmers had been exploited, their liberties had been denied, their right to free speech and a petition had been scoffed at. They were called revolutionary. So are you. It was the largest political rally ever held in American history. Over 150,000 people turned out at Chicago's Riverview Park to hear the famous radio priest, Father Charles E. Coghlan. People from throughout the area, the state and nearby states, came to get a close glimpse of the man they considered to be their leader and their hero. People wanted to get close to Father Coughlin, to touch his hand. Politicians nationwide were shocked at his support. The United States that Congress has the right to coin, issue, and regulate the value of money. That's good Americanism, and it's good enough for me. Every politician today in the Democratic or Republican ranks who sits upon one of the thrones of the mighty doesn't believe in that part of the Constitution. They don't want to believe in that part of the Constitution. They're not even Americans, these so-called Democrats and Republicans. They might say that's radical. But the real radical is the Simon Legree of high finance who turns his lash about your shoulders and exploits from your pocketbook its last penny. We try to become hard-boiled with Harding. We try to stay out of war with Woodrow. And we try to write a new deal with Franklin Delano. We're through with the sham battle of politicians, and now we're on our own. Therefore, under your congressional district presidents, form your battalion. Take up the shield of your defense, unsheathe the sword of your truth, and carry on in Illinois so that the communists, on the one hand, cannot scourge us, and that the modern capitalists, on the other, cannot flee. Father Coughlin was one of the chief promoters of the veterans bonus. This was money to be paid to every single serviceman who served in World War I. Two billion dollars would be paid as part of the veterans bonus. 
The idea was to put more money into circulation. Roosevelt opposed the plan. And when it, when it was passed by the Congress, Roosevelt vetoed the veterans' bonus. Father Coughlin addressed several massive crowds of veterans and citizens in Madison Square Garden and other places and created such an uproar in support of the veterans bonus that the Congress overrode President Roosevelt's veto. Here is one of Coughlin's speeches in support of the bonus bill. Find the president with all due respect that not one of those soldiers or sailor boys who long last week spent their bonus for buying clothes for their children, dresses for their wives, paying bills to the doctor and butcher and elsewhere, and who today feel like children who've had their toys taken from them, broken hearted. <laughs> These soldiers and sailors in no eyes caused the war which crimsoned the rivers and the streams of France with blood. Nevertheless, they who cared not for just competition, they who regarded money as their god and their fellow beings as their cannon fodder, still hold sway with their advice in telling the president to veto the Patman bonus plan. <laughs> that it was not the soldiers alone who were vetoed this afternoon. It was the American people. <laughs> 1776, Washington and Jefferson and their compatriots had hurled at them lies and charges and the epithet of revolutionary. Their lands were overtaxed. Their laborers and farmers had been exploited. Their liberties had been denied. Their right to free speech and a petition had been scoffed at. They were called revolutionary. And so are you. Thank General Johnson, the cream puff general, the chocolate soldier, for classifying you with Washington and Jefferson and the men of Lexington and Congress. In 1936, Father Coughlin formed the National Union for Social Justice, a political action organization. The idea was to implement his 16 points for economic reform. The convention was packed by over 45,000 people. And here we see that founding meeting taking place in Cleveland, Ohio. Ladies and gentlemen, I sincerely thank you from the bottom of my heart for the honor which you have conferred upon me. Your acclamation has made me feel very small indeed, simply because I have some small appreciation of the tremendous responsibility which is mine. I shall do my best to be your leader. One thing I do know, I will never turn my back upon you, cost what it may, and will never sell you out for any patronage.
The depression still waxed strong as the powers of deflation reached out to confiscate homes, to capture farms, and to keep that ever-marching army of jobless upon our streets, wondering when God in his mercy would lift his hand. I dared you and challenged you to organize so that the people, if not the president, would drive the money changers from the temple, and you did it! My dear friends, that among other things in the National Union for Social Justice, we are Christian in so far as we believe in Christ's principle of love your neighbor as yourself. And with that principle, I challenge every Jew in this nation to tell me that he does not believe in it. There is no need of communizing all the factories and the fields and the forests and the mines under a new kind of God made of flesh and blood and clay and hatred. When men become so prideful that they believe their destiny is to rewrite the eternal law of God, it's time for their fellow citizens to rise up in their wrath and through the agency of ballots and not bullets to relegate them to the pages of the past. common people have got together. At last we have an organization whereby under the leadership which I can afford and under the excellent loyalty which you can contribute, we will succeed. Children and shelterless men and women still knocked at our door for a pittance. The depression still waxed strong as the powers of deflation reached out to confiscate homes, to capture farms, and to keep that ever-marching army of jobless upon our streets, wondering when God in his mercy would lift his hand. Then came letters pouring into the offices of the National Union, asking for action. I dared you and challenged you to organize so that the people, if not the president, would drive the money changers from the temple, and you did it! the inflationist, Roosevelt or the National Union? I saw this savagery of our civilization, where the mightier had risen up to exploit the weaker, where wealth was concentrated in the hands of a few. All this savagery that dwelt in the luxury of palaces dwelt in the luxury of edibles and of wearables, this savagery that permitted those who believed in Christianity and in the brotherhood of mankind and in the brotherhood of Christ to see millions of our fellow citizens starving in the midst of plenty. Are you going to leave this country worse than you found it, 
or are you going to fight for your children? And divided we fall, we're Americans first, forgetting that we ever were Democrats or ever were Republicans. God bless you. President Roosevelt, being a sitting president, was very cleverly able to adopt the economic reform programs of Father Coughlin. He brought into action and placed into law Social Security, the Minimum Wage Act, and unemployment insurance. Because of this, and also with the Republican Party in disrepute for its blame, because it was blamed for the Depression, Roosevelt won by a landslide, and the Union Party's days were over. Here we see Roosevelt's statement as he signs these crucial measures into law. The measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefits through unemployment compensation, through old age pensions, and through increased services for the protection of children and the prevention of ill health. This law represents also a cornerstone in a structure which is being built but is by no means complete, a structure intended to lessen the force a possible future depression. Father Coughlin continued to oppose President Franklin D. Roosevelt. We were becoming more and more engaged in aiding Great Britain in World War II. They called them isolationists, Colonel Charles Lindbergh. General Robert Wood, head of Sears Roebuck, Colonel Robert McCormick, owner of the Chicago Tribune, Lillian Gish, the movie actress from Hollywood, and Father Charles Coughlin, who were fighting to keep America out of the murderous World War II. Roosevelt was doing everything possible to get us into the war. Father Coughlin was forced off the air in 1939 because of organized Jewish boycotts of all the radio stations who were carrying his Sunday afternoon program. But he continued to publish Social Justice and continued to fight President Roosevelt. Here we see a headline on Social Justice. Roosevelt is trying to get America into the war. Another social justice headline, will the war force Father Coughlin to cease his operations and his publication? Here is the next to the last issue of social justice ever published in April of 1942 with the headline, the Attorney General is getting ready to stop social justice. Here is the last issue ever published of social justice. Will Father Coughlin be jailed? At that time, Pearl Harbor had already been bombed. A number of patriotic Americans were charged and tried with sedition for being opposed to the war. Father Coughlin was never charged and never, never tried. The charges against all the others were eventually dismissed in 1944. But Father Coughlin went to Washington, D.C., and he challenged the Attorney General of the United States, Francis, Francis Biddle. He said, either indict me for sedition or let me publish my magazine as part of America's free press. Francis Biddle stammered, 
hemmed and hawed, gave no reply, and called and told him to, your, to his face, Biddle, you are a damn liar. You were born a coward, you're a coward today, and you will die a coward. Father Coughlin was the true epitome of the fighting Irishman. He never gave up the fight. And patriotic Americans are just now again today learning of the great work of Father Coughlin. Roosevelt said, social justice is finished. It will never appear again after his April 1942 ban. Well, we have brought Father Coughlin back. On this video, on the audio, the special edition of Social Justice, which has been published by The Truth at Last, tens of thousands of copies are now in circulation. The Truth at Last will carry carefully selected articles written in the 1930s, 1940 and 1941 by Father Coughlin on subjects which apply today. So indeed, Father Coughlin still lives and is still awakening new people. For the first time, thousands of young people will see this video. They will learn from it and a new Father Coughlin will emerge. His word and his work will continue. I can promise you that. And you will see the fruits of this labor in future editions of The Truth at Last. Thank you, and God bless you.